Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. Today I want to take a quick look at... Burrows and Badgers, a skirmish game of anthropomorphic animals by Michael Lovejoy. Um, this is a game that uh, I've wanted for a little while and the other day um, I happened to get uh, an Amazon credit to my account. Um, and so um, I did what all good consumers do and I consumed. Um, this was the first thing that sprang to mind, so, so that's what I bought. Um, and it's a cool little book. Um, it's by Osprey Games. Uh, it's published by Osprey Games. And um, it's sort of got that um, Frostgrave type. It, it reminded me immediately of the Frostgrave rule book in terms of sort of size and, and appearance. And um, and it's got really lovely artwork, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and yeah, so I thought I'd do a quick, a quick look at it on camera. I don't have any of the miniatures yet. Um, this is... Uh, a game that's got its own dedicated line of anthropomorphic animal miniatures from Oathsworn Miniatures, and they are really rather lovely, and there's a lot of pictures of them in this book. And I need to go onto their website, and um, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna gonna pick what I like the look of, really. Um, but yeah, I had an opportunity to get the book first, so I've got the book, and I've had a, had a quick flick through it, and it's really cool. Um, Burrows and Badgers is a skirmish game. It's a um, pretty straightforward um, rule set. It's it's quite interesting in that um, statistics for the, the characters um, are are based on on dice, and um, you get a uh, different 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 types of dice for different types of statistics. So um, your big beef cakes might be rolling a, a d12 when they attack, whereas your little mice and 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 other other tiny creatures, sparrows, might be rolling a d4. Um, and it's, it's there's an, an opposed dice rolling system in that um, uh, one one character will roll to attack, the other character will roll to defend, and you compare and the differences of the damage. Um, and there's a really interesting sort of um, critical hit system where if you roll the perfect value of your dice, you get to add seven to your total. So if you've got a, a d4. Um, and you roll a four, you get to add seven to it. So there's a chance for the little guys to actually take out the big guys. Um, and it's also really quite interesting because it um, it means that your big beefcakes um, are more consistent in terms of putting out higher levels of damage. Um, but because they're slower, they don't critical hit as often. They, you know, like if you're rolling a d12, you've only got a one in twelve chance of actually hitting on a critical. Um, whereas your mice and things like that, they're rolling d4s. So that's sort of the, the main interesting point of the rule set is that this opposed dice rolling with the critical hit system that does a really nice way of um, modeling how some creatures are faster but weaker and others are slower but stronger. Um, the other selling point is obviously the, um, the the setting. It's a really nice setting with, with anthropomorphic animals. So you get foxes and beavers and badgers fighting each other. It's quite nice. And, um, and it's set, um, it appears to be set, basically in um anglo-saxon england so here's a map of the area and um i'm not an expert on on anglo-saxon history but um down here we've got mears um which is uh, uh mercia and then you've got northumbria here so that's uh, northumbria and then um strathclotta up here um that's uh, strathclyde and uh, the the background is that there's a, a king red wolf, and there was a, a there was a king red wolf of uh, Northumbria who, I believe, um, he vanished under mysterious circumstances, and that is in fact the um, the storyline of of this game is that the king has gone missing, and it's um, given rise to opportunities for different um, different races like the foxes and things like that to kind of move in and try and try and uh, gain gain some some political control. So you have your various different groups of animals um, having little skirmish battles across across the English countryside, and it's really rather sweet. It's um it's a really really interesting um, setting, um, and yeah, and it's got really really nice miniatures that are all uh, all produced by I believe um, unless I'm mistaken they're all, they're all actually sculpted by by Michael Lovejoy himself um, and his partner, and. Um, and yeah, it's really cool. Um, I'm quite excited to, to get to the table because it's not it's not a very complicated rule system, um, but there's there's just it's a really 
you know, there's, there's something quite special about about anthropomorphic animals anyway. And um, and there's also something very special about about the artwork in this book. Um, the artwork is actually by Gary Chalk. And Gary Chalk, um, old timers like me might remember that he did um, some work for Games Workshop and things like that. And is in fact, if I reach off camera here, responsible for the artwork for the first edition of Talisman, the Magical Quest game. This is actually a piece of Gary Chalk artwork, unless I am very much mistaken. Um, so yeah, he is a, a, a bit of a legend, really. And he has his artwork all the way through this book. And I think even even if you're not interested in, in the rule set, um, the, the combination of this artwork in this book and then the miniatures that you can get to go with the game just makes it something that I think a lot of people are going to be interested in. Um, but I'm definitely interested in getting the game to the table. And um, I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna go too deep and deeply into what's going on in this, in this book, but um, yeah, it's, if I can just show you up close some of the uh, some of the critters these are beautifully painted versions of um, uh, it's small production runs as far as I know for the, for the miniatures and they're all metal and uh, um, unless there's any um, that I've not seen yet they're all single piece as well which is actually a really cool thing for um, people who are new to, to, to hobby gaming in fact this is a very um, I would say this is a very very good entry level type tabletop game because um first of all it's a skirmish game so you're not building a whole army um you can start with as little as three models on your team so even if you've got to collect both sides of the four of, of the forces if you don't have anyone to play with so you want to build two armies yourself you're basically only buying six or seven miniatures to start with anyway um the anthropomorphic animals um it, that's a very appealing thing i think um for a lot, of, a lot of war games are quite gritty, and, and for younger children, you may not want them to be playing in the in the realms of Warhammer Forty Thousand just yet. If I mean, if they're very young, but you know, otters and weasels bopping each other on the head um, is a little bit more whimsical. Even if they are, you know, hitting each other with swords and things, you can. It, it just, it's a more whimsical world. So I think there's that as well, um, and then the single piece miniatures um, is is good, and also I think um, there's a lot of lot of characters have fur on, and fur is one of the one of the easy things to paint um, when you're first starting out with painting. If you've never done it before, um, you can pretty much get away with a base coat and then just some dry brushing to bring out the the raised detailing. Look at that squirrel <laughs> with with the halberd and the full suit of armor. That's cool. Um. So yeah, I think this is this is a, a product that you know it's relatively inexpensive to get into. Um, you need the rule book, and this this rule book covers everything. It covers all of the rules. It's got all of the statistics. Um, it's got um, all of the scenarios, and it's got all of the campaign system. Because there is a really cool little campaign system where um, between adventures you do a sort of necromunda style thing where you you heal for you heal your characters, and some of them get serious persistent injuries, and you can hire new members to your team. Um, and you can develop your den. You can like grow a magic garden, grow some herbs to uh, to help your spellcasters get better and things like that. What have we got here? We have a noble mouse fighting an evil shrew. I have no idea why he's the noble mouse and that's the evil shrew. That's 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 a stereotype, isn't it? I'm being racist or speciesist. Um, look at that guy. He's got a crossbow. Um, the miniatures are... Re they're full of character. They're really, really interesting. And like I said, it's just this, this beautiful artwork all the way through. Um, there's a cool spell casting system um, where... One of, the, one of the things I like about this is it's very old school in as much as um, you... you pick a character to join your team you pick one to be a leader and you can give them a special skill and you get to pick the skill and then as you upgrade you get new skills if you want a spellcaster in your team you can pick any any creature and choose it to be a spellcaster you can pick um, from a selection of different schools of magic like wild magic or noble magic um, and then you can pick spells from within those schools and for each spell um, that some of their statistics get weaker so you can really load them up with spells but they become very very squishy or you can 
you know, give them just one or two spells and make them a bit more of a combat mage. So it's that really, really cool kind of, um, it's the kind of thing where you could spend ages building your warband, you know, picking different weapons and, and items and really sort of making it a very, very personal experience. And I, I, I love that sort of thing. Um, I could probably, sp it, it's we've got a almost role-playing game style element to, to the creation of your warband. And, um, oh, lovely piece of artwork. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's got a very, very role-playing game style feel to it, and, um, oh, okay, him, he's up to no good. I do like that a lot. And yeah, and I like all the options you can get for, for creation, like, here's a, you know, here's a, a little look at your different types of animals. You've got small beasts, medium beasts. And then there's large beasts and massive beasts, and the massive beasts are the badgers. And I find it amusing that, that the massive animals are still only badgers and owls and dogs. So <laughs> it's just uh, just reminds you that you know you're dealing with a very small scale of things, and you know a lot of the creatures are mice and shrews. There's a shrew riding a stag beetle, one of the miniatures. It's it's, it's pretty funny. That's a cool piece of art. I could say that about every piece of art in this book. Um, it's really, it's that sort of beautiful old fashioned um, role playing game um, style of line art. It's really nice. Uh, one of the things you can do, you can, you can pick an allegiance for your warband. There's, there's royalists, rogues, free beasts and wild beasts and they all get various different benefits. The royalists are better fighters. The wild beasts um, are better at moving around in difficult terrain, and then there's like the, the whole schools of magic, and you know it's really interesting to be able to sort of go through and and pick which spells you want and and, and use them in, diff in in conjunction with different creatures. So you may pick like a stronger creature to load up with more spells and things like that to offset the um, the negative impact of being too much of a spell spellcaster. Um, there are there are some problems that I have noticed in this book. Um, this page has actually reminded me to talk about this. This is a beautiful book. The artwork is amazing. The painted miniatures are amazing. The photography of the miniatures is great. The layout is great. Um, it's a little bit verbose at times. Um, I think there's certain situations where it, rather than having a paragraph of text, you could have just had, this is it, this is it, this is it. Um, it's sort of laid out in a so that when you're flicking through the rules during the game you don't have to read a paragraph of text to find whether it's a plus one or a plus two modifier on a certain weapon um, it's like you, you get blocks of text instead but um, but generally it's, it's lovely but it needed another another go through with the editing um, there's a lot of a lot of little errors like here it says um, Natural magic is fortitude based and cast spell roll-offs are taking using the caster's fortitude statistic. Um, so it should be, should be um, taken. So natural magic is fortitude based and cast spell roll-offs are taken using the caster's fortitude statistic. Um, so that's just a, a minor grammatical error. The problem is um, it's a cut and paste error because every single spell, magic school, um, has the same thing. Light magic is presence-based and cast spell rollers are taking using the casters. And and then dark magic, it's there again. So it's it's like a uh, it's perpetuated throughout every school of magic that that one error. But then there's also um, there's other other minor things like um, over here. There's any poison and. Um, I think there was another one on this page, which I can't immediately find. But there's um, there's lots of little, um, little little minor errors that could have just been been picked up in, in the edit, and I would say that um, there's probably an error every other page. Uh, not major errors, but just little minor ones like that little typos or, you know, just things that that could could have been caught and would have would have just improved the overall i mean it's a nice book it's a it's a lovely book lovely artwork but it just those that little attention to detail would have just just made it that 
extra little bit better. But, uh, but other than that, it's it's a very cool looking game. I'm very excited to go. Um, I'm going to go on the Oath Swarm website and I'm going to going to pick some models that I like the look of. There's a there's a mage adder that's wrapped around the staff, which is really nice. There's one of the big beasties, that badger. Not looking quite quite as noble as the badger on the front cover. Um, but yeah, there's, I'm really looking forward to sort of creating a custom team and giving it some a real some real story and real character because I mean you can you can do so many interesting things. It's like if you've got um, someone with a bow and arrow, there's different types of arrow you can get, and you purchase the arrows on a per arrow basis so you've got your regular arrows and then you also got some special arrows and it's like when you use those arrows they're gone for good and um there's ingredients that you can use for spell casting um and then when you've used those those ingredients they're gone and that's very much um rem like advanced hero quest was where you had spell caster and they had ingredients to use to cast the spells and once those ingredients were gone they had to go and buy more or, or acquire more in some way um, and there's a really cool um, selection of skills and things that, and so you can as you um, as you play campaigns, you develop your characters and you teach them new skills and and it's all just good stuff. Here's another badger. That's a female badger. And I just think um, it just feels like it's because it's a relatively simple rule set and because it's. Um, anthropomorphic animals and because it's a small scale um it, it just it just feels like something that that you can sort of get into quite easily and um and have fun with it it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't seem like highly competitive in fact there is a point right at the front of the book if i can find it Fair warning, Burrows and Badgers is a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. Well, yeah. The game is meant to be fun for both players rather than overly competitive. If you're looking for a tournament game, this probably isn't it. If you want to enjoy a full campaign where your characters can change and develop over the course of your adventures, then you've picked up the right book. Um, and that seems fair enough. Um, and then there's a, on the, a couple of pages in, it's sort of there's another thing that says if you're having trouble finding a rule in the middle of a game, just dice off for it and, and crack on. It's one of those sort of games. It's um, it feels very very old school. Um, and it, it, in a good way and um, I I like it a lot and I think that's about all I've got to say on it for now um, I'm just flicking through the last few pages so but um, um, I think I think you get a gist of, of where I'm coming from and um, I'm hoping um, that this has been an interesting look at at, um, at things here you can see there's different scenarios there's uh, six different scenarios that you can you can play through. Um, I think it's six. Maybe it's more. No, it's more. There's a witch hunt. There's a there's an armadillo witch hunter. Um, uh, there's lost in the fog. So there's, oh, there's actually there's actually a lot more scenarios than I thought for. And there's a uh, secondary objectives within within the uh, scenarios. And yeah, it's all good. And um, of course, at the back of the book. It's got charts to photocopy, although you can download these online as well, which is probably easier than trying to stick this book through your photocopier. And that's it, really. Um, I'm probably going to do some coverage on this once I've got some miniatures and things um, and maybe do a playthrough. Um, let me know if you would be interested in seeing that. And until then, um, I will say bye-bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone.